Brian, you've got the floor. Other for Michelle um, for discussion, sort of around what um, how we make decisions as watershed groups. It's not easy, and that's the reason I asked the question. I, I used to be with the Deerfield River Watershed Group, um, and we had a few issues where uh, it was really tough to figure out, you know, how our mission and values should inform our decisions surrounding a particular er issue. Oftentimes, these groups start with a, with a particular goal in mind. Um, and then once the group is started, um, you sort of have to figure out what, what you want to be and how your mission is going to guide you in decision making. Um, one clear example is oftentimes recreation and ecology, ecological needs can be at odds with one another. A simple example would be on the Fort River, um, we would love for it to be more passable by canoe and kayak, um, and, but there are tons of blowdowns across the river. We know that large woody debris is really important for river ecology. And so we've been thinking about how could we balance the, the desire to make the river more accessible so that more people appreciate and care for it with we, the fact that we know that, we, that large wood is serving an important role. So anyhow, that's just a side note that I wanted to sort of, um, I'm interested in exploring further, especially with this group. Um, so I've got the mission up here. Um, I'll just give you a second to read it. So it's pretty uh, standard language, um, but it does speak to um, our interest in both eco eco ecological integrity, as well as recognizing that this is a cultural and human resource, um, the Fort River watershed and, and the river itself. Um, so our mission is really focused to the river itself, be again, because in past watershed groups I've been in, it, it was just um, quote unquote watershed. And then when economic things came up, they said, well, the economy's in the watershed. And, I, I, and when we came up with our mission statement, we really wanted to be clear that you know, the rivers and tributaries are our main focus. And to the extent that land management impacts rivers, yes, we're interested, but, um, but really to keep that focus on rivers and tributaries um, uh, within the watershed. So really water resources are, are our main um, focus. Um, and here's just a map of the watershed. You can see uh, a few main tributaries draining uh, in total five different towns, Shootsbury, Pelham, Belchertown, Amherst, and Hadley, come together at the Fort River right in the middle of Amherst. Um, and sort of the, the bulk of Amherst um, is drained by the Fort River watershed. Um, and it's a really fantastic watershed. It's sort of your uh, classic New England watershed um, in that it, its headwaters are defined by um, lots of forest, uh, steep headwater streams, a lot of really healthy cold water fisheries. There are some um, municipal water reservoirs in the upper reaches as well. So it's an important uh, municipal water resource. Moving downstream, some of these photos are from the lower reaches. Um, it's, uh, in general, um, a well-loved recreational resource. Um, and I, I just want to check to make sure. Can folks see my mouse here? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. I'm going to try and grab my uh, laser pointer. All right. Um, so the Emily Dickinson Trail is a trail along the river right in the middle of the watershed. Amethyst Brook is a really popular conservation area. And um, a Fort River Trail is this fully accessible mile loop trail um, that is managed by the Fish and Wildlife Service. So there's a lot of recreational assets developed within the watershed. Um, and in addition to that, uh, similar to the upper reaches of the Mill River and Cushman Brook, um, there's a really active uh, uh, put and take fishery in the lower reaches. So lots of stocking and recreational fishing. Um, I alluded to uh, paddling. Um, this is a uh, section of the Fort River behind uh, Kilworth's Field, if you've ever used the sports fields on Stanley Street. Um, it's a really windy, beautiful stretch of river. Um, and this is uh, my friend Nick Reich and his kids canoeing along here. Um, and so it is canoeable. Um, about probably seven or eight months a year, it, it's, it's a little tricky in the dead of summer, although not this summer because it was so wet. Um, and in addition to that, there are many really popular swimming holes. So this is one of the swimming holes right in the middle of town. There are uh, three or four places that are popular on a hot summer's day. Um, this particular one on a hot day probably gets 100 to 200 users throughout the day, um, not all at one time. Um, so again, really popular swimming areas. Um, another popular one is, is Groff Park right in the middle of the town of um, Amherst. So we're interested as a watershed group in enhancing and promoting these recreational opportunities. 
um, recognizing that the people are an important part of what makes the watershed great um, and that uh, we're not, um, we are not a wildlife refuge um, for the exclusive use of wildlife and we're hoping that we can sort of enhance ecological integrity at the same time as um, enhancing recreation. And a key way is of course water quality. Um, many times uh, throughout the summer this particular uh, swimming hole um, the bacteria levels exceed the safe th swimming threshold and so a big goal of our group is to bring bacteria levels throughout the watershed back down to where um, recreation is safe at all um, not at all flows but at least at low flows and base flows. Um, in addition to a goal of, of enhancing recreation we've been really involved in developing uh, community science and volunteerism throughout the watershed um, so this year we're hosting our third annual watershed cleanup, and we do that in coordination with the Connecticut River Conservancy. Um, in addition to that, uh, we do water sampling, so bi-weekly water sampling, uh, one of the upstream and one of the downstream recreation areas, and I'll show those data in just a second. Um, and again, the main contaminant of concern is bacteria. We're really interested in um, enhancing recreation within the river. We're also interested in nutrient data and starting to do some nutrients, but really our, our first primary concern is making the river swimmable and usable for humans at all, um, at all times of the year. And then last, um, we're organized and ready and poised for advocacy when the, op when the opportunity arises. So far in our three-year existence, um, we haven't um, really had the need to launch any major advocacy campaigns, but we have a clear mission and we're sort of prepared to do that when the time comes. Um, a little bit of background that I, I probably should have started with. So we're an all-volunteer organization, and we've got about uh, 10 active board members and an email list of about 200 people of folks who have either volunteered or come to cleanups. We are not a 501c3. Um, we are um, a affiliate of the Connecticut River Conservancy. So this is a Connecticut River watershed-wide group. Folks are probably familiar with it. Um, and it's been a really great arrangement for us. We came together in 2019. Um, surrounding one, persistently high bacteria levels in the river, and two, the opportunity to, con to conserve a big parcel of land through which there's two and a half kilometers of river that I'll show you in a minute. Um, and so um, one thing I'd like to sort of um, just be an evangelist for is that this arrangement has been fantastic for us. Um, we don't do any accounting, we don't pay for insurance, um, we do almost no administrative tasks at all. Um, we pay a small overhead to Connecticut River Conservancy on all the money that comes into our group. Um, and in return, we get um, tenfold services in return. Um, so it's been a really great arrangement for a small group like ours. Um, anything other background things? I think that's it. I want to finish up not too much time to leave time for questions. Um, so uh, in collaboration and coordination with Connecticut River Conservancy, we've been doing biweekly water sampling since 2020. Um, and we do it at two locations. So here's our watershed map again. The upstream location is the Amethyst Brook uh, Conservation Area, and the downstream location is Groff Park. Um, the locations are separated as the crow flies by very little distance, probably only two miles, um, but a lot changes in the interim, whereby the Amethyst Brook is really representative of headwaters. It's very cold, very clear, um, lots of native brook trout swimming and darting around there as you visit. Um, and the Groff Park reach is much warmer, much more nutrient rich. You can see it by the submerged aquatic vegetation in the river um, and persistently higher bacteria levels. So here in both these plots, this is 2020, this is 2021. We're looking at dates on the x-axis, bacterial levels in coliforming units per 100, milli per 100 milliliters. Don't worry about the units, just know that higher bacteria is bad. Um, and what you can see is these red dots are almost always above the threshold for safe swimming. So these red dots are at Groff Park and the blue triangles are typically below, um, with the exception of high flows like this uh, late August, early September date. In 2021, we saw similar patterns with, in general, Roth Park uh, having higher bacteria loads. And we're really trying to pin down the exact cause of that. We believe it's an urban tributary that I'll show you a little bit more about in a second. So um, zooming out uh, whole watershed, um, we, similar to the Fort, uh, the uh, Lake Warner group, we're really interested in sort of total nutrient loads. Um, these are data from the 2019 sample Palooza. So this is again as a Connecticut River Conservancy organized event where they sample the all the tributaries of the Connecticut River, or as many as they can. 
Um, and here you can see uh, in terms of phosphorus concentrations, the Fort River was the worst in 2019. It's consistently bad. Um, and so this is something we're really interested in, in trying to get to the root causes of and figure out how to, to remediate. Um, in 2019, our first year, um, we did a, um, we commissioned the Conway School of Landscape Design and Planning to do a full watershed plan for us. Um, and so we've got a, a sort of laundry list of things we're hoping to check off and um, start to make some improvements on both bacteria and uh, phosphorus. One of the biggest issues we believe is this urban watershed outlined in pink here. This is the Fearing Brook watershed and it drains uh, parts of downtown Amherst and all of Amherst College campus. Um, and uh, water samples from there taken during the summer. The bacteria concentrations are typically labeled as too numerous to count and they cut, the cutoff is 2400. So you know, our Roth Park, uh, Fort River samples are in the mid, sort of the mid two to 300 levels. These Fearing Brook samples have been in excess of 2400. So 10 times higher than Groff Park. And so even though the discharge of this little stream is low, the concentration is so high that we think a lot of the bacterial loading to the river may be coming from the Fearing Brook. And here's just an image to see what part of it looks like. A lot of it is culverted. Um, a lot of it is parking lot runoff. Um, and there's been some uh, coliform DNA done there, but it's still inconclusive as to the exact cause. But um, Anna Martini, an Amherst College professor, and her students have been doing a lot of work this summer to try to pin down where the bacteria is coming into Fearing Brook to help us better remediate it. In addition to that, there's a big EPA-funded remediation project happening right now, um, doing a floodplain reconnection work on the lower Fearing Brook. So lowering um, the lower floodplain at, uh, right before it drops into the Fort River, um, with the hope that during high flows, some of the sediment and nutrients will be sequestered on the floodplain once it can re-access the floodplain again. Um, the last thing, and again, this was uh, one of the impetuses for the group starting, um, is this Hickory Ridge Golf Course. Um, this is a 150 acre property right in the middle of town. It includes two and a half kilometers uh, of river running through it and a really exciting opportunity um, to provide recreation and outdoor access and river access to people in town. And it's not just any folks, it tends to be um, it tends to be located, just happens to be located in sort of the highest concentration of lower income housing in town um, and close to environmental justice communities. And so I've labeled the names of some of these um, complexes where there's some uh, more affordable housing. And in addition to this being the more affordable housing in town, it's also probably the part of town with the least access currently to, to outdoor recreation. And so um, the prospect of having this golf course become public access is really exciting. And the town of Amherst is almost there on it. And so we'll be really engaged in part of the sort of river access, river restoration um, that opportunities that this presents. Um, and so there's already golf course, th golf cart paths through the course. So really exciting opportunities for um, accessible recreation paths. This is not actually a picture of the golf course. It was just a nice picture of a golf cart path. Um, I'll show you a few photos of the uh, golf course. Uh, so here's one showing elevation. The color corresponds to meters above sea level. The river here is about 40 meters above sea level. And the color you can see, there's very little uh, elevation or topography throughout much of the course. Part of the reason it's, it's closing is because um, the private golf course company was just fed up with the flooding all the time and we had we lost a lot of money. Um, and of course, it was being made worse by climate change and the most conditions here. Um, so this is what it looks like now. A lot of the river is unvegetated. Um, a lot of rip-wrapped or reinforced uh, sort of engineered banks. So we're excited to um, see the banks return to more natural conditions. Here's another example of a bend in the river here. Um, this is what the river looks like about probably 20 days a year. Um, so it's really prone to flooding. It's serving a great service to the community by absorbing floodwaters. It's a natural probably floodplain forest location. You can see here on the right side of the picture um, this is silver maple growing out of the, uh, the floodplain, one of the few species of trees that can tolerate a little inundation. And so you can already see it's a natural floodplain. Um, and it's not a localized issue. Uh, this is a, a, a friend was at a national planning conference right as I was getting into this. And she said, Brian, there was a whole day uh, event just looking at what are we going to do with golf courses as they revert to public spaces. And the reason for this is is not just climate change, but more largely demographics. Um, baby boomers are starting to age out of golf. The Tiger Woods uh, phenomenon is ending. 
and, um, and just to less and less interest. And so this will be something on the horizon in communities throughout the country, presenting opportunities for recreation and, and river restoration. And so with that, I'll say thanks and ask what questions folks have. Well, if nobody minds, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned um, that your uh, your main goal is the reduction of uh, bacteria. What kind of strategies are you guys planning to employ for that? Yeah, great question. So the hope is that this little tiny urban watershed is our is our main culprit. And if that's the case, um, there's already a consulting report that's come out um, from two years back highlighting some best management practices we might use. They range from anything from there's a, a sewer pipe, a, a submerged sewer pipe where uh, down cutting of the river channel has actually exposed this sewer pipe, which may just be leaking into the, the stream. So basically sealing up that sewer pipe. Um, and a lot of it is gonna be around stormwater management. So figuring out ways to capture as much of that um, stormwater as possible. One thing that's in our favor is that a lot of the land in the watershed is Amherst College campus. Um, and so um, hopefully there'll be a, a, a well-heeled uh, partner um, that'll be interested in helping to clean it up. But um, yeah, stormwater retention and things like that. And as I mentioned, this floodplain reconnection project, we'll see if it, if it has any impact. Mm. I see Ken has a hand raised as well. Hi, yeah, this is Ken uh, from the Conway School. Nice to see you. Um, I'm curious, your, your data go back to 2020 and what you showed us, I assume you test, have been testing going farther back, and I'm just curious if there have been any correlations with uh, any of the changes in behavior or activities since COVID kicked in. Uh, could it, do you see any reflection in uh, the time of COVID to bacteria or other levels of uh, pollution in the water and what that, if that's true, if it might indicate any potential solutions. Yeah, it's a really interesting question, Ken. There's going to be uh, about 16 million COVID studies uh, in the next 20 years on everything from education. And I hadn't even thought about water quality. Our data set only goes back to, to 2020. We just reformed oh. it in 2019. But this, the Connecticut River Conservancy, who runs our samples, they have a massive data set going back many, many years. Um, at watersheds through, you know, sub watersheds throughout the Connecticut River uh, watershed. And so it'd be really interesting to see if there have been any systematic changes. Um, it's a great idea for grant proposal. Thank you. And I should probably wrap up as I, I think I was supposed to end it at uh, 1240. Okay. I have Anyone? a. Oh, go ahead. One, one quick question, and maybe it's not a quick answer is how did you get into your arrangement with the Connecticut River um, Conservancy? Yeah, I think I can make that answer quick. Um, I had been with the Deerfield River Watershed Association and our group was sort of suffering from low energy. And one way that we sort of helped solve some of the issues of having excess administrative, administrative duties was to, to merge with CRC. Um, I, when, I, when we formed the Fort River Group, I said, you know, it's been working great for the Deerfield River. Um, what do you all think? Do, do we want to have a treasurer? Do we want to have a bank account? Do we want to file taxes? And the answer to all those questions was no. And so, um, and it, I, frankly, it's been much more than just um, lack of aggravation. It's been really nice to have CRC as an active partner and, um, you know, to be just tied into everything they're doing. Um, I found there's been very little downside and lots of upside. I can definitely second that. We've been working with the Connecticut River Conservancy for uh, seven years, I think. And so um, just having a lab for somebody to do the sampling consistently is really uh, a great asset to watershed groups. Um, I'd also say in response to Ken's um, <clears throat> comment that the, the frequency of sampling is also extremely important. If you're sampling every two weeks, it's not gonna be as good as it is if you're sampling every week. You could be missing storms. You know, the thing, it, it's highly correlated to sort of flow and, and overland flow and timing of your sample. So it looked like 
Fort River was the highest, you know, small watershed in that collection from Sampaloosa, and it was on that day. But I think systematically over the season that Mill River is way higher, and Lake Warner is even sort of uh, uncharacteristically represented in a as a low value there, where it it does actually have a low value in relation to the Mill River, but it's still higher than it was at twenty. It's usually running higher than that. Thanks a lot, Brian. That was fabulous, and I'm I'm always I've been inspired by the Fort River since the beginning. We had already been at it for five years, and I was like, wait a minute, someone's starting something that we were doing already. What? But it, it's such a nice thing to have a sister watershed, somebody who's right next to you, who's also trying to have you know where you have mutual goals. And uh, you know, as a watershed person, I always think about paired watershed analyses that are done you know all over the place. What's happening here, and what's happening here. So it's great to have a partner. Thanks very much. Music